Counting to God, Part 9. We've been discussing a book by Douglas L., Counting to God, A Personal Journey Through Science to Belief. It is available on the internet for free for those of you who want to look up what we have to say. I will not read it word for word. I'm leaving some stuff out, and some of it is definitely worth looking at. So if you get curious about the yellow ellipses, uh, feel free to go back to the book and read the original. But uh, the uh, picture on the book uh, you may recognize as part of the backdrop for the, uh, uh, for the slides I've been using. We've been in part two, the science of belief, and you may remember we have covered uh, several chapters, including the universe itself, the plan of the universe, the origin of life, the plan of life, and now we're coming to a chapter that he writes with a certain amount of reluctance, I think, uh, Puzzles of Macroevolution. How did life get so complex? And he has a quote at the beginning that says, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Charles Darwin. Now he goes on to say, I cannot find any such case. Um, and you'll notice that it's phrased in such a way that it's virtually impossible to prove but perhaps to give evidence for may be a little easier. The term macroevolution refers to major changes in species. To me, the puzzles of macroevolution and the growing mountain of evidence against neo-Darwinian theory are the fifth wonder of modern science, the fifth of seven in our count to God. The last chapter explored some of the wonder in the technology of life, such as DNA. This chapter explores some of the wonder in the creation of wholly new species including human beings. As I dug deeper into the science of belief, I was forced to confront the subject of evolution. It sounds reluctant. I was hesitant to do that. I majored in math and physics, not biology, and I knew I had a lot to learn. I also knew I was entering a field of enormous controversy. Perhaps nowhere is the animosity between belief and scientism greater than in the debate about evolution. I knew evolution is taught just about everywhere. Clearly, organisms have developed and changed over time. Modern DNA analysis suggests connections between species. Apes look sort of like people, don't they? And the conflict seemed unnecessary. Can we just avoid the whole subject? Couldn't God have used evolution to create human beings? And of course, the answer is God being God, he could use anything he wanted to. Uh, some writers skip the evolution debate altogether. In nonsense of a high order, the, the confused and illusory world of the atheist, Rabbi Moshe Everick calls it the ideological equivalent of the Battle of Stalingrad. And in some ways, I, I would agree with that personally. Um, and refers to Darwinian evolution as the Mag Maginot line of atheism which of course can just easily be bypassed, if you wish. His biology discussion focuses on the origin of life, and I think rightly so, and I agree with that, by the way. Um, you win at the origin of life, and there's no point in, in maintaining a, a biological evolution. For the origin of the information necessary to build life is the Achilles heel of Neo-Darwinian theory. But I knew enough to tantalize, and my curiosity would not let me look away. You've got to look at it regardless of how uh, emotionally fraught the uh, subject is. So my journey took me to evolution, and this chapter is about the puzzles and wonders that I found. We'll start by defining evolution, and we'll see that the only two explanations for macroevolution are neo-Darwinian theory and design. We'll see that the predictions of neo-Darwinian theory do not match the facts, such as in the fossil record. 
We'll look at theories diehard Darwinists use to explain the fossil gaps. Then we'll look at three other areas where the predictions of neo-Darwinian theory do not match the facts. Junk DNA, irreducible complexity, and orphan genes. Those are the parts we'll get to next week. Finally, we'll marvel over the creation of human beings. Two explanations. And here's where he's going to maintain there is a dichotomy. What is evolution? The first meaning, according to one online dictionary, is any process of formation or change. Everyone I know agrees that life changes. Museums display skeletons of massive dinosaurs, and they sure don't walk around anymore, and certainly not in the numbers they used to. Um, many species are now extinct. You can find drawings of the dodo bird, which was hunted to extinction in the late 1600s. You often read about other species under pressure to survive. The real controversy is over what causes macroevolution. What creates radically different organisms with radically different biological systems and body parts? What explains the variety of life, the differences between an amoeba, an ant, a catfish, a wolf, a hummingbird, and a human being? And I would add to that list and a pine tree or a rose. Organisms sometimes do change or evolve in the broad sense of the word, for better or for worse, over time. It is clear an accepted scientific fact that changes that increase an organism's ability to survive and reproduce are more likely to be carried on to future generations. It is no accident that polar bears are white. This is called natural selection. Accidental, random, haphazard changes in DNA do occur and cause mutations. That is also true. Most, probably far more than 99.99%, I've seen estimates of over one in a million are helpful, are harmful or have no discernible effect. However, some may accidentally confer a slight advantage and make that organism more likely to survive and more likely to have offspring that survive. It makes sense that a gene with a reproductive advantage is likely given enough time to slowly spread throughout a population. Now those are all arguments that are standardly used, don't you believe in evolution? And. Uh, it depends on how you define evolution. If you want to say that those things are operative, I would say yes. If you want to say those things are, uh, can be demonstrated to be operative, I would say yes. Uh, it's a lot different if you say, can those things account for everything in nature? And there, I think Douglas Hill and I would both say no. But, and that's the question he raises next. But does natural selection have the ability? Is it a strong enough force to create wholly new species? Well, it depends on how you define species uh, and how you define wholly new. Um, that is the debate, and it was a debate right from the beginning. The co-founder of the theory, Alfred Russell Wallace, disavowed natural selection in 1869 in favor of what Wallace called intelligent evolution. In the 1800s, natural selection was often referred to as the Darwin and Wallace theory. They shared the discovery. But when Wallace became a heretic, um, it became Darwinian theory. Well before genetics was a science, Charles Darwin and others noted that organisms appeared to adapt to changes in their environment. The common perception is that Darwin studied changes in the beak of, beaks of finches in the Galapagos Islands of South America, and he certainly did travel to the Galapagos, although recent scholarship suggests the finch story was it contrived a century later. It was just that, a story. Um, although that doesn't stop it from being repeated in textbooks periodically. In any event, about 30 years after his visit to the Galapagos and after correspondence with Alfred Russell Wallace, Darwin published his theory of natural selection. 
Darwin and Wallace were not the first to notice that organisms were suited to their environments and that the healthiest, most fit individuals tended to have more offspring. That was suggested years earlier by others such as Edward Blythe. But Blythe thought natural selection simply maintained the stability of species by weeding out unfit members. Blythe did not think natural selection could create new forms of life. Charles Darwin suggested, or more precisely stated, that it could. In his famous book on the origin of species, Darwin suggested that natural selection alone could create the tremendous variety of life we observe today. According to the college textbook, Molecular Biology of the Cell, it is estimated that there are more than 10 million, perhaps 100 million, living species on Earth today. Darwin claimed that the gradual process of accidental mutation and natural selection is solely responsible for this variety. This belief in accidental mutation and natural selection alone is the central tenet of the modern version of Darwin's theory, which again is called Neo-Darwinism or Neo-Darwinian theory. Neo-Darwinists proclaim evolution is a fact, by which they mean that Darwin's theory of what causes macroevolution is a fact. They are wrong. Change is a fact. What causes change is a theory. It is interesting at this point to note that Richard Dawkins specifically said that evolution is a fact refers to uh, evolution being that all uh, organisms share a common descent. Um, so what I think is happening is when it's people say evolution is a fact, they often don't want to define evolution too strictly because, you see, they can fall back on the very first definition and everybody agrees, even creationists believe that there has been some uh, evolution by that definition. But then you take that definition and you ch change it to another definition and another definition, and pretty soon um, you have uh, evolution by natural selection with no uh, uh, divine or even planned input. And, and that's really what's going on is uh, the definition of evolution is being shifted so where you agree with the one part you have to agree with the whole thing. Neo-Darwinian theory is under increasing at attack from atheists as well as from religious persons because its predictions do not match the facts and because it does not provide a mathematical model for the creation of radically different biological systems and body parts. There is general agreement that natural selection can gradually alter species, but many conclude that it does not have the ability to create new forms of life. In that case, what does cause it? After that 2005 debate in Boston on intelligent design, which he described in Chapter 6, I learned that hundreds of scientists, yes, hundreds, do not believe in that accidental mutations in natural selection alone could have resulted in many of the complex biological systems in living organisms. One website lists over 850 scientists as of August 2013 who agreed with the following statement. We are skeptical of claims for the ability of random mutation and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. Careful examination of the evidence for Darwinian theory should be encouraged. Uh, why not more of them? Well, actually, it turns out that if you put your name on that piece of paper, or virtual piece of paper in this case, um, you put your career at risk. And for that reason, the Discovery Institute, which originally started this thing, um, backed off on it very rapidly because they didn't want to give a list of, that would be convenient for people to say, Ah, uh, this person's on the list, therefore we will not hire him or her. And uh, the note, let's see if I can, there's a note that, that makes that point on the website. I learned the fossil record does not contain, uh, listen to this, because when he says I learned, that means that at one point he was ignorant of it, and he was a fairly bright person doing, um, uh, fairly bright is an understatement, I think, um, 
uh, doing, um, uh, learning what he was supposed to in school and believing it enough to disregard what he was taught by his parents and uh, church members. I learned the fossil record does not contain the myriad transitional forms of evolving organisms predicted by Charles Darwin. He thought at one point it did. Wonder where he got that idea. I learned that new biological systems typically, not rarely, but typically, require complex new biological parts, proteins, and detailed new instructions, DNA coding, on how to make the parts and put the parts together, each of which is almost mathematically impossible to arise by accident. And the whole system is that much more mathematically impossible. I learned that many of these systems are irreducibly complex. They do not work unless all the parts are present and assembled in the right way. Where had he heard otherwise? I learned that accidental mutations generally destroy information and are not likely to produce a new type of life. Where had he gotten the impression that accidental mutations are likely to be helpful? Think about that. I learned that what causes macroevolution, the creation of radically new organisms with radically new biological systems and body parts, is very much the subject of legitimate scientific debate. I wonder where he learned that it shouldn't be part of a legitimate scientific debate. The more than 850 scientists who question the neo-Darwinian theory of macroevolution do not dispute that species change over time. They do not dispute that natural selection causes species to adapt over time to changes in their environment. Remember all that list we were going through? What they do dispute is that accidental mutations and natural selection alone could have created the enormous diversity of life, and they particularly question whether accidental mutations and natural selection can create radically new biological systems and body parts. In other words, it has been demonstrated that natural selection can result in some birds having slightly bigger beaks than others, but it is not documented and not even reasonable, some scientists claim, and I think he would agree with them, um, to think that natural selection alone it created complex systems such as the eye, the backbone, or the human brain. To put it another way, natural selection may adjust the size of the finch beak, but, it, but can it create the finch? The problem is not the survival of the fittest, but the arrival of the fittest. Or the modification even of the fittest is not the problem. It is how do you get there in the first place. Many of these 850 scientists are atheists. In 2012, noted atheist philosopher Thomas Nagel released a new book, Mind and Cosmos, Why the Materialist Neo-Darwinian Conception of, the, of Nature is Almost Certainly False. Nagel states that proponents of design deserve our gratitude for challenging Neo-Darwinian theory. He admits honestly that his atheism prevents him from embracing intelligent design. But if you're going to be honest, you have to look at the facts, and neo-Darwinism neo does not work. So, as we asked at the beginning of this chapter, how did life get so complex? At this time, there are only two competing explanations. One is neo-Darwinian theory, accidental mutations and natural selection. The other is design. It's a stark choice, and the atheists such as Thomas Nagel, who recognize the flaws in neo-Darwinian theory, seek a third choice, but they have nothing to propose. For now, at least, it's Darwin or design. If you want to explain how life got so complex, they are the only games in town. And there are lots of people who would love to have a third game in town. Neo-Darwinian theory has a clear appeal. It is a straightforward explanation based on observation for the enormous diversity of life. 
The fourth floor of the American Museum of Natural History in New York City has an incredible exhibit that is, in a way, a shrine to evolution. I'll skip some of the uh, description there. If you just look at the fabulous fossils, it is reasonable to imagine all these changes occurred as a result of gradual incremental changes in the manner proposed by Charles Darwin. I believe Archaeopteryx belongs in that. Uh, and then he has a table, and I'm only going to give you the first uh, part of the table. And he's going to give you a list of various uh, Neo-Darwinian uh, predictions and then the facts that don't support those predictions. The subject is a fossil record of when major new species appear. By a Neo-Darwinian prediction, it's very clear, step-by-step -step evolution of major new species is expected, um, and yet the fact is that there are periods of explosions when multiple new body plans and species suddenly appear. We're going to go into that a little more now. Um, there's a whole series of them that I'm going to skip over if you're interested. Look at the book. But if you put Neo-Darwinian theory under the microscope of science and probe it fully with human observation, experimentation, and logic, you are likely to conclude that when it comes to macroevolution at least, something is quite wrong. As the table on the preceding page shows, the predictions of Neo-Darwinian theory do not match the facts. The fossil record. When it comes to evolution, there is fact and there is theory. Let's start with the facts and then see which theory best fits the facts. As, and as for the facts, let's start with the fossil record. About 150 years ago, when On the Origin of Species was first published, the fossil record was mostly a mystery. Today we know a lot. Although there are surely new discoveries to be made, the overall picture has come into fairly clear focus as revealed by the research of thousands of scientists. Rocks around the world tell the same general story. Fossilized bacteria are found in rocks 3.465 billion years old. Life developed fairly slowly after that for close to 3 billion years. Around 570 million years ago, some wholly new creatures appeared, but with the primary exception of sponges, those organisms became extinct and their body plans, quote, bear no clear relationship, end quote, to any later organism. And the reference is there. Then, 541 million years ago, life exploded. Rocks around the world, especially the Burgess Shale in Canada and the Meotian Tianshan rocks of China, tell a consistent and amazing story. During perhaps 25 million years, life on Earth exploded from mostly single-cell organism to multiple-celled organisms with complex body structures. This burst of creativity is called the Cambrian Explosion. It is fact, not theory, and it is directly contrary to neo-Darwinian models of gradual change. Darwin said, quote, this is an amazing quote because I don't see this quoted very often. If numerous species belonging to the same genera or families have really started in li into life all at once, the fact would be fatal to the theory of descent with slow modification through natural selection. That's a pretty big confession. And if, if the Cambrian explosion is what it appears to be, it's a direct conflict with Neo-Darwinian theory, or at least with Darwinian theory. Skipping down a little bit further, according to the above group of experts, which I couldn't find uh, uh, named, of today's 33 animal phyla, 23 came into existence during the Cambrian explosion at the beginning of the Cambrian era. Two predate the Cambrian, two came later into the Cambrian, in the Cambrian era, and six arose after the Cambrian era. So 70% of all body plans of all of today's animals were created in a relatively short period of time beginning 541 million years ago. Most of this explosion in animal life may have occurred in as little as six million years. And then he quotes Steve Meyer in Darwin's Doubt, who's quoting some other people. Um, six million years. To give you a little perspective, he's going to give you that next. 
This is not what a Darwinist would predict. Neo-Darwinian theory predicts the opposite. Neo-Darwinian theory predicts that over time, as the number of species on Earth expanded and the cumulative gene pool grew, one would expect accidental mutations to multiply and create more and more major phyla, animal body plans. It start out simple and get more complex. As life diversified, the creature, creation of major new species should accelerate. Yet, the fossil record reveals that the most stunning changes in evolution occurred in a very short period. If the history of life on Earth were compressed into 24 hours, 6 million years would be less than 3 minutes. Or, to put it another way, if you compress it into a basketball game of 48 minutes, we're talking 10 seconds. If that were a, if that were, if we were keeping score, that would be a scoring explosion. 10 seconds, you get over half your points in the whole game. It is not just the sudden and tremendous variety of new life that contradicts neo-Darwinian theory. A second contradiction is the top-down nature of the fossil record where we first see major new body plans and very different forms of life, and then variations on those themes. Neo-Darwinian theory predicts the opposite. It predicts minor variation leading slowly to greater changes. The Cambrian explosion has been called biology's Big Bang. As one scientist put it, new bodily designs appear in the fossil record as Athena did from the head of Zeus, full-blown and ready to go doesn't sound very evolution-y, does it? Charles Darwin was aware of this relatively sudden explosive explosion in the fossil record, but he believed the record was incomplete and that time and further research would fill in the gaps. That has not happened. He knew that a lack of transitional forms would be the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against the theory. The fossil record has other explosions. The Silurio-Devonian primary radiation of land biotas, plants and animal life on land, is the terrestrial equivalent of the much debated Cambrian explosion of marine fa uh, faunas. As for the sudden appearance of fish species, and this is a choice quote, this is one count in the creationist charge that can only evoke in unison from paleontologists a plea of nolo contender. We have no evidence to prove that we're innocent. In the early tertiary explosion, many bird and mammal groups appear in a short time period lacking immediately recognizable ancestral forms. There's the bird explosion, there's the mammal explosion. There's the flowering plant explosion. This happens all the time. The point is, that the fossil record does not support a Darwinian gradualist explanation. And you can hear him saying, why didn't they tell me when I was 15 and making up my mind? A third way the fossil record contradicts neo-Darwinian theory is that there are few, if any, transitional organisms. According to Darwin, the number of intermediate varieties which had formerly existed must be truly enormous. I think today all scientists, even diehard Darwinists, admit the fossil record is contrary in this way, third way to Darwin's expectations. And you can read some of the comments that are there. New York's American Museum of Natural History hasn't got the, the message. Maybe it didn't want to get the message. In one of its rooms of fabulous fossils, on the walls behind a superb skeleton of Tyrannosaurus rex is Archaeopteryx, a bird fossil with reptile-like teeth, and a statement that this single creature validates Darwin's theories. It is not clear how Archaeopteryx fits in the history of life. Modern birds are probably not descended from it, and it appears in the fossil record tens of millions of years, before the dinosaurs it supposedly is descended from, 
So there are problems with the, the fossil itself, but that is not what I find most objectionable. What I find most objectionable is that even if Archaeopteryx was a true transitional creature, it has little company in the fossil record. And it is plain error to claim that a single odd creature v validates Neo-Darwinian theory. The truly enormous number of intermediate varieties predicted by Charles Darwin does not exist. New York's Museum of Natural History should not get a pass from intellectual honesty. Cut. You are seeing him charge somebody with intellectual dishonesty. All paleontologists know that the fossil record contains precious little in the way of intermediate forms. Transitions between the major groups are character characteristically abrupt. That's a quote. <coughs> Stephen Jay Gould said in 1977. He called it the trade secret of paleontology. Why a secret? Because if you let the creationists know, they're going to run with this. It is sad that the American Museum of Natural History in New York makes false claims to prop up Darwin's theory but not surprising because the reigning paradigm of our society does not permit honest intellectual debate about the possibility of design. The zeitgeist has just been formally charged. So how do Gould and Eldridge attempt to prop up Darwin's theory since they still believe in Darwin's theory? to explain away these contradictions to what Charles Darwin predicted, to plug the gaps in the fossil record. In 1972, they pre proposed punctuated equilibrium, where most evolution takes place rapidly in small populations that do not leave a fossil record. The dog ate my homework. <coughs> but why and how? How does that result from natural selection from the gradual accumulation of ant accidental changes? Punctuated equilibrium offers no explanation for why rapid change would ever occur in a short period of time in a small population. It merely assumes that because that's what the fossil record suggests, it must have resulted from natural selection and accidental mutations. It's religious dogma being held on to. That's the logical gap of neo-Darwinian theory. Whatever you observe, you just say evolution caused it. I'm going to skip over a cartoon he has. You don't have to explain and you don't have to give a mathematical analysis. Remember, he kind of likes mathematical analyses. That's what he so cut his teeth on almost literally. Um, you don't have to give a mathematical analysis of the likelihood of a beneficial mutation or multiple favorable genes spreading through a population. Fred Hoyle did the math in 1987 and emphatically concluded it is impossible. You explain the survival of an organism because of its fitness. And its fitness because of its survival. And you disregard that the logic is obviously circular. As Darwin Doubter David Berlinski says, this is not a parody of evolutionary thinking. It is evolutionary thinking. The neo-Darwinian theory of evolution cannot be falsified because whatever you observe, evolution caused it. One could even say it was designed not to be falsifiable. Where does the information theory come from? Or does the information come from? Accidental mutations generally destroy genetic information. Suppose you take a page of text and start mutating the letters and spaces. You randomly change some letters and spaces into others, take letters and spaces out in random places, and add new letters and spaces in random places. How likely is it is that you will transform the text into something readable and coherent? Without intelligence, without design, without purpose, the odds are vanishingly small. In chapter 10, we saw how impossible, how mind-blowingly unlikely it is that monkeys might 
ever type at random even a short snippet of Shakespeare. In the figure below are two similar proteins from E. coli, a bacterium that lives in the human guts. In human guts, fortunately for us, most strains are benign. The two proteins look similar, but they have different functions. One study found that at least seven coordinated mutations must take place before one of these proteins can perform the function of the other even a little bit. Based on complex mathematical models, the estimated time for this is 10 to the 27th years. That's basically impossible. Our universe is only 1.4 times 10 to the 10th years old. And remember, if you're doing a, some kind of a subtraction, that means that the probability of it happening once is 1 in 10 to the 17th. You are more likely to win the lottery. In fact, you are more likely to be struck by lightning than that to be true. And this is bacteria where we expect about 1,000 uh, generations each year. There is no mathematical model for Darwinian evolution. The emperor of neo-Darwinian theory has no mathematical clothes, said by a mathematical nerd. There's the two pictures. They're taken from uh, Gager and Axe. And I think we've seen this, uh, actually, this photo ourselves before. And you can see a lot of similarities, a few differences, a little different angle for a few of those things, do completely different jobs. They're almost the same. Seven amino acids out of uh, whatever that is, 150, 200, uh, is all you need to change one to the other. But getting those seven is extremely unlikely. I promise to give you counter arguments, and here's one from Richard Dawkins and Stephen Jay Gould, among others. They say it is false that Darwin's theory rests on chance alone. They say it works by cumulative selection. Say you start with a piece of gibberish and you want to transform it into meaningful text. You want to transform gibberish into what fools these mortals be. You give the gibberish a spin. You randomly change letters or mutate the DNA code in the world of life, and some of the resulting English letters or DNA letters may be correct. Not many, but perhaps one or maybe more. You hold on to any that are correct. You give the remaining English or DNA letters a second spin mutation. Perhaps you get another one or more that are correct, and now you hold on to those also. You keep doing this. This process will converge in a reasonable period of time to yield the English phrase or the DNA code you're looking for. You may remember uh, Dawkins' program. We, he thinks it is a weasel. Dawkins and many others with umpteen degrees and peer-reviewed articles to their credit claim this cumulative selection drives Darwinian evolution. To which I meekly respond in the words of the great John McEnroe, you cannot be serious. How does the gene know what it is looking for? How does it cumulatively select good letters and keep mutating only the bad letters? You get a design product, and we're not supposed to notice a wizard behind the curtain running the show. You sneak intelligence in the back door, but still claim the process is natural. So to Dawkins and many others, cumulative selection works like this. You have an ordinary gene, let's call him Joe just sitting there, hiding out in the DNA, minding his own business. Not a lot happens in the genome. Sure, there's replication, but the error rate is only about one letter in a billion. But one day, there's a mistake, and a DNA letter is changed by accident. Joe says, hey, that feels good. I might be able to use that someday, and decides to hang on to that change for future generations. It is a slow process, but Joe is patient. Sure enough, just uh, 125,314 generations later, somehow explicitly a string of DNA letters from Joe's buddy, Hal, gets inserted by accident where Joe is being replicated. And Joe says, hey, you know, that feels good too. I've got a hunch I might be able to use those extra letters someday, particularly if another 27 changes are made in just the right spots in my DNA code. Well, what do you know? But it all works out perfect for Joe in just 72,437,197 more generations, which, by the way, is more generations than are supposed to have uh, been between 
uh, monkeys and humans, or between apes and humans, actually between monkeys and humans too. Um, but Joe is able to hold on tight all the changes that Joe likes and suspects he might use someday, and he's able to accept only those new changes that ultimately work just right with the old. Also, somehow, none of these changes affect the protein that Joe is the code for in any negative way. So that they and Joe are fully functional through all of these generations right up to that special day, that day when the last accidental change is made and Joe transforms into a totally new gene with new capabilities. Joe is no longer ordinary Joe. He is now Malcolm. And Malcolm can br build proteins Joe could never imagine. With Malcolm's proteins, the organism has a major evolutionary advantage, and in the blink of an evolutionary eye, Malcolm conquers the entire species. Anyhow, that's neo-Darwinian theory. And to quote another of my heroes, celebrity author Dave Barry, he does have a sewage living station in Grand Forks, North Dakota, named after him, I am not making this up. I mean, really, what a fairy tale. We are supposed to believe this? I have never seen such a patently absurd theory proposed by so many, quote, educated, end quote, people. If it were any subject other than Darwinian dogma where dissent is published, pub, punished by career death, this nonsense would be torn to shreds. This is not belief. This is not reading the data in different ways. Notice now he is, he's just not giving you, you can believe this or you can believe that. This is plain illogic. No scientist should be exempt from intellectual honesty. Cut. <coughs> Any institution of science that cannot or will not reject this nonsense does not reserve, uh, deserve our respect. Boy, if you carry that to its extreme, the National Institutes of Health. This guy is mad. He is very unhappy at what he has found out is the <coughs> truth that he had always been told was not. In the example above, while all the changes were being made, Protein Joe was not affected until he transformed into Malcolm. I think that almost anyone who has ever programmed a computer or worked on a complex piece of machinery knows that is a ridiculous assumption. According to University of Illinois biologist Tom Frazetta, the evolutionary problem is, in a real sense, the gradual improvement of an engine while it is still running. Now, I'm going to stop there because I think that, um, first of all, we'd have information overload if we kept going. And secondly, I want to give you a chance to talk about this. My own take is that Douglas L. approaches the subject with reluctance, but discovered that evolutionary theory, far from being a bulwark of atheism, is, in fact, one of its weaknesses. He reacts with disbelief at how dense his old side, the side he used to be on, is and how one-sided their presentations are. He accuses the theory of intellectual dishonesty. And by implication, the people who run the, the, uh, the National Museum of uh, History, he sees a religious fervor clouding the minds of many pop popularizers of the theory to the point of intellectual dishonesty. I wonder if not wanting to go there had anything to do with his reluctance to approach the subject. He is making a clean break with science. I wonder if not wanting to go there can contribute to some other conservative Christians' reluctance to be seen as anti-science. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Um, I might, I'm probably missing something, so you can straighten me out, but 
he seems to still believe in three billion plus years of evolution. So if it wasn't macroevolution going on during that time, what, how does, I wonder how he, what does he think is going on all that time in the developing of the species or? Uh, well, if you were to ask him to put together a theory, there are two things to be said. Okay, number one is that I think he would say that, that it was designed and that God did some of it. He just took longer than the standard uh, uh, biblical story would suggest. Um, so that would, there, God would be doing the macroevolution, maybe. That's, but he, he says, no, right. there you, is no. When you suddenly have a trilobite, that is a fresh creation. Um, the second thing I'm going to say is that I'm not sure he's fully settled into that. Um, I, have, I have an email from him that suggests that he is giving serious consideration to the idea that it may be uh, that the age question is every bit as uh, badly handled by the scientific community as the design question. And I think it's important for us to realize that um, people are not always stuck where they are and that one should not pretend that that always is the case. Uh, we know that there are a few people who, shall we say, gradually move from our side to the other side. There are a few people who gradually move from the other side to our side. I'll just give you one example. Henry Morris, who, was, who went from being, you know, kind of a, well, you have to believe science and it's got most of the answers to, well, science doesn't have all the answers, but they probably have the time frame right to, uh, you know what, they got the time frame wrong too. And he wound up being a founder of uh, Institute for Creation Research. And so it is not true that people always, always flip from one side to the other, that they're sometimes, they're sitting in the middle. Um, and that doesn't mean they will always stay there. So uh, while it's fair to analyze his position, and I think when he wrote the book, his position was one, that he felt that the age question had pretty well been settled. Um, I think you want to be a little careful about pinning him too closely to that um, because people do slowly develop with time, um, some slowly rot with time, um, and if one is being careful to describe where they are, one would be better off to say, um, this is where he is at this time, and, or this is, and to be precise, this is where he was when he wrote the book. Uh, and I think that the kind of questions that he's raising will eventually result, if he keeps on going where he is, in his raising serious questions and perhaps even flipping uh, in terms of where he believes probably the truth lies in terms of the age itself. I would, I would think so. Well, I can't help but uh, comment. Well, first I'll say, you know, that this is, uh, I appreciate his courage. Uh, and uh, moving so directly into the issue, and he is, uh, he's, he's done a major, con made a major contribution here. Um, when you get to the time issue, uh, which very soon comes into this picture, uh, we have to bear in mind that uh, it takes a certain amount of um, 
courage, we're going to state, to uh, believe that uh, there was a major flood, that uh, because this is not going on right now. It takes uh, some courage also to say that the past uh, had to be the same as the present. Uh, and uh, he uh, certainly there's no restriction on, on logic to say that the present is the key to the past. Uh, this is, uh, often the past is not the key to the present. And when we look at the uh, fossil record and so on, we do see, of course, uh, rather strong, compelling evidence that the past is not the key to the present. Uh, or to be precise, the present is not the key to the past. It, uh, uh, th things have been different in the past. No, no question about that. Uh, one of the uh, his analysis of the fossil record, you know, is so so correct. I mean, it's uh, we keep talking about these changes, that keep, and the literature keeps coming out. You know, every few weeks you see a new a new fossil intermediate has been found here and there, and there. they're all related closely to others doesn't help evolution at all because the major problem is between the major types. Where are all these intermediates between the different phyla, uh, the different groups of plants and so on? Where are they? They're not there. Uh, that's all very fine. The, uh, an issue that uh, you face in all this is why is there this apparent progress of development as you go up through the fossil layer with simpler life below and more complex life above. And that gets into ecological zonation and so on, and while there are some good explanations for this, that, that's where the issue becomes uh, uh, more discussable, I might say. Uh, but uh, on the other side, I would say there's a lot of data out there that is hard to explain unless you believe in a major flood. Well, I think one thing that we need to keep in mind while we're looking at this uh, is that uh, Douglas L. is training 90 plus close to 99% of his firepower on the argument that there is no design. <clears throat> there are advantages to allowing him to continue doing that without raising too much of a fuss over the fact that he and uh, we don't agree. In fact, there are certain advantages to pointing out that he and we don't agree, or at least didn't when he wrote the book. Um, because what atheists want to do, or at least the atheists who are making these kinds of arguments want to do, is to stereotype all of their opponents into being short-age creationists, which means that they're arguing from a religious premise, which means that they can be ignored because they're just religiously biased. The fact of the matter is Douglas L. didn't come at it from that direction at all. The fact of the matter is that the arguments are there whether you start out as a creationist or not, and that they're not religiously biased. They're good arguments. And the other side simply doesn't have an answer for them, and so they're trying to rule them out of court before they begin. Well, you guys just are prejudiced. 
You see, because they don't have an answer for it. If they had an answer for it, they would give us the answer. And I think this is really important. Uh, it's a really important point to make. This is not just, you know, well, yeah, I grew up in a Seventh-day Adventist tradition. I did. And so one could say that, you know, everything that I'm arguing for is just because that's how everybody else argues. I would hope that those who know me would find that difficult to believe. But, but certainly for those who don't know me and who can be persuaded that all religious people really are kind of biased, um, it makes a decent argument. But they don't have an answer for Douglas L. Because he started out on their side. And he is very explicit as to what arguments made the difference. And they weren't that he wanted to, uh, he wanted to be a religious person and he knew that if he didn't accept this, why he couldn't be a religious person, so therefore he simply dropped all of this stuff. He, uh, in fact, started out on their side. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And he moved because of the evidence. And he can be very explicit about which evidence he moved because of. And that's, that forces them, in some sense, to actually deal with the arguments. And they can't do that. And that's why the fight. Uh, go ahead here, and then we'll bring the mic down. As a young pastor, I zealously pursued the good journal, Christianity Today in which a report was made of Protestant ministers, and I assume Catholic priests, I don't remember, and what they believed. They didn't believe anything. They didn't believe in miracles. They didn't believe in the resurrection of Christ. They didn't, they didn't believe anything. And I was shocked. How can this august group of holy people maintain a religion in which they don't believe simply for the remuneration that it provides, they are in mass condemned. So it does not surprise me that scientists in their church, in their religion, just as feverishly maintain what they believe, <laughs> which is totally false and they know it. Now that leaves the rest of us bumpkins who depend upon these two groups, we don't believe anything. Whoa. <laughs> Have there been any responses to Douglas L's work? Have you seen anything? That's a good question. I haven't actually researched that. Um, I, I found it a, a interesting and in places, and this is one of them, a compelling read. You know, what he is saying basically is these people are wrong. These people should know that they're wrong. The kindest thing you can say is that they've been brainwashed or they're closing their eyes because they're afraid of what they'll see. <laughs> That's the kindest explanation. I mean, this is wicked. This is just, you know, when you start saying that any institution that supports this is not intellectually honest, you haven't seen any published. Reactions. No, I have not. <laughs> that just, that just, you know, the rest of the book so far has been very ironic, and in fact, uh, he's been pretty careful about who he's, you know, uh, and and interestingly, I mean, he's he's willing to say that people like Thomas Nagel, it's okay, you know, you can't believe in in a god, so therefore. 
uh, you're going to say, well, design doesn't, I don't buy design, it's okay. But boy, you know, he's going after the people who, who put up Archaeopteryx as C, it proves. You know, in defense of those people, I will say one thing. I do think that historically it was true. Darwin had this wonderful theory, but there were no, there were no uh, intermediate forms. Archaeopteryx came in just in time to give his theory a boost, historically. Aha, see, there's a half bird, half reptile. And I think that's the reason why it's hung on to so much. Is because it is the example. And it is, by the way, one of the ten icons of evolution that, uh, that uh, Jonathan Wells comments about. It'll get into every single textbook in biology because it's exhibit A. The horse is exhibit B. After that, where is exhibit C? Well, the truth of the matter is it's not very good. In fact, I had an interesting discussion uh, in Riverside not that long ago uh, about uh, the subject of evolution. And uh, I said, well, it'd be really interesting, you know, to find a half bear half cat, half dog, half bear, or something like that, you know, in the fossil record, where it was difficult to tell which one it was because it was kind of a cross, and it came before both bears and dogs. That would be nice, because then you would have some way of going through it. Well, I had the, uh, my compatriot on the other side say, uh, oh, but they exist. And I thought, have I missed something? So I said, um, well, I'd like to see the references. Well, as it turns out, he had to admit that he didn't actually have any. He had to retract that part of his comment. He still said, well, but it's, you know, but, it, it, but it, there aren't half bears, half dogs. There aren't half bears, half cats. There's... You know, uh, this should be, and it should be not just half bears, half cats, if you think about it. There should be three quarters bear, one quarter cat, or however it comes out. In other words, there should be not just one, there should be an infinite number of stages. Well, not infinite, but you know, innumerable numbers of stages. It, that's the theory. Charles Darwin said it way back when. Uh, punctuated e equilibrium is an attempt to say, well, you don't actually need to find them because it happens off in a corner where you can't see it. But Thank you, man. the dog ate my homework. Yeah, I know. It, it's strange that preservation of fossils will only occur when evolution is not going on in that model. Uh, that, that, that's not going to hold up uh, because uh, when you have all these millions of fossils changing, the uh, only time you preserve them is when they're in a punctuated equilibrium mode. Well, Where they stay the same for millions of years. That's strange. Yeah. And, you know, average species in the fossil record are Different figures, but a million years is uh, a minimum. Ten million years, uh, I think, is about average. It's, uh, yeah. Uh, this, this, uh, it's another fact that it doesn't fit, but I, I would uh, say uh, from a different perspective, I mean, while the fossil record, to me at least, uh, is a closed case against evolution and and while there is a lot of evolutionary uh, 
ideas that uh, float around and that you can argue back and forth on. Uh, the, and uh, you can, there's strong evidence for the flood. I would say, look, let's look at some other aspect here, another aspect here. If God was the creator and he created over these millions of years, and, and the fossil record is a record, a gradual record of those advancements, uh, what kind of a God would create species only to see them disappear and then try another time of another species and it disappears? Uh, an intelligent God who could create life, why, why, why would he do that? To me, that the flood has to explain this. Uh, and explains it better than progressive creation does. Uh, that God made it so many mistakes over the fossil record, over the over so many uh, billions of years. Uh, uh, if he could create these very complex things of life, he didn't have to make so many mistakes. You know, one of the things that's interesting is that argument, of course, is used in precisely the reverse way by atheists who say, what kind of a god would create that kind of stuff? Um, and I think that uh, uh, if I could kind of summarize that particular aspect of it, it's kind of like there are actually three basic positions. One, it took a long time and there was no god. Two, it took a long time, but God did it. And three, uh, it took a short time and God did it. And uh, there's different subpositions within that, yeah. but that's basically the uh, that's basically the outline. And I I think that the I think that the intermediate position, it took a long time, but God did it, actually has a lot of theological problems. Um, and I don't think it's a stable position. Uh, that's why I'm kind of hopeful if Douglas L. Has already finds that the scientific community has fooled him once, I think it won't take him that much more work to, for him to believe that uh, maybe it's fooled him twice. Um, and that uh, the intermediate position is a position that people are forced to when they can't accept either of the other ends. Yeah, we have a. We have. Um, do you think what you discovered uh, 30 years ago, perhaps, has it tried to creep into Adventism? <laughs> what you discovered among other Christian bodies and Catholicism, which of course has been rampant for who knows how many how long, has it found its way or is trying to find its way into Adventism? Adventism usually follows other trends by about 20 years. <laughs> In the track, you live long enough, you see the major changes. <clears throat> Things that I would have been disfellowshipped for 30 years ago are common practice. <clears throat> And it's getting worse, and we're going to see even more appreciation of our message in the, in the area of the LGBT, whatever the letters are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Do you do one? No. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't want to be. <laughs> Well, um, have some more fun while uh, uh, Douglas L. 
raises his complaints against uh, uh, more of evolutionary theory and raises some very specific scientific objections to evolutionary theory. Uh, he's going to talk about two things that I think are particularly interesting in the next section. One of them is ENCODE. That's the discovery that, uh, depending on how you define function, almost all of the human genome seems to have a function. And uh, the implications that that has and then also he's going to discuss orphan genes. And when he gets done, I don't see how evolutionary theory really has much of a leg to stand on. Uh, looking at the evidence that he amasses, I would have to agree with him that what you're seeing is dogmatism dressed up as science rather than uh, some kind of objective phenomena. But <coughs> we'll, we'll see what happens next week.